Hey everyone, welcome to It Had To Be Said, the refuge of deviants, thieves, looters, border jumpers, deserters, pirates, rioters, guerrillas, and other public benefactors. For a good part of my life, people have told me I have freedom of speech, and that I should value it. It's that freedom that keeps tyranny in check, right? But recently, I've been asking questions about that. What if no one spoke the truth? It wouldn't really matter if you were free in a legal sense to speak. I've said lots of things in the past that I now think are wrong, because I had a more simplistic view of things. Most of us use our freedom to say the things the people in power want us to say to use their words and believe in their values, because that's all we know. This video is about understanding how and why our speech is limited, and how not being allowed to express the truth holds us back. Not all of us just repeat the propaganda, of course, but voices that don't contribute to the propaganda have always been denied a platform until recently. There are people who have something worth saying, who've experienced the world and realize all is not as it seems, but they don't have the opportunity to tell people. If I couldn't afford a computer and Wi-Fi, I wouldn't have access to this medium, to listen or be heard. Yet, how much do you think some of the poorest people could change how you thought about the causes of poverty and violence? If I spent all my time working, I wouldn't be here. But I bet there are millions of workers who can tell us about mistreatment at the hands of their bosses, who could destroy the image of the companies or whole industries they work for just by getting the truth out. As Rosa Luxemburg said, the most revolutionary thing one can do is always proclaim loudly what is happening. So it's no wonder most people don't get a voice. In a dictatorship, you're forced to say you agree with the status quo. In a so-called democracy, you're merely persuaded every day from every medium that the system is correct and just has a few temporary problems, maybe the wrong politicians, lack of reform. Debates rage over minor differences of opinion that get magnified and turn into moral questions so that we tear into each other instead of considering the system as a whole. I've heard people argue endlessly about raising taxes or spending without ever explaining the purpose of such measures and how realistically those measures will lead to their desired goals. Why even have bitter debates over things like policy that you don't even influence? Dissenting voices that challenge the propaganda are never heard from on conventional media, although now you can look for them on social media. Social media is, of course, a very mixed bag, as distinct from the consistent propaganda of the corporate media, so not every challenge to the status quo is based on facts. A whole movement has sprung up because a guy falsely claimed vaccines caused autism, after all. So it's vital to evaluate what you hear critically. But at least some people who never had a voice before can now say what had to be said. And I think it's essential that we listen, because some people have first-hand knowledge of social problems. We don't have to keep making incorrect assumptions about problems and solutions, reinventing wheels and then spinning them. Without people telling it like it is, especially people whose voices have continually been marginalized, our knowledge, imaginations, and movements will stagnate. Because until we learn new perspectives, we're likely to keep believing this is the way things should be. Or if there's a problem, it lies with individual politicians or programs or campaign finance laws, not the broader systems that have power over us. We might want to change things about our own lives, find different people to answer to the lobbyists, dream of reforms that'll never get passed, but the system itself is sound. Mm.
After all, the words it uses to describe itself are good. Freedom of speech, democracy, the justice system, peace officers and peacekeepers. But the language they use is intentionally deceptive. Just like on my resume, I say I started a bunch of my own companies and on my Tinder profile I'm leaning on a Porsche, the ruling class makes us believe what isn't so. We're all selling an illusion of sorts, except my Tinder profile doesn't start wars. It doesn't regularly throw people out into the streets because they can't afford rent. It doesn't daily throw people into prisons for doing what it takes to survive. The state does, but you wouldn't know it from watching the news because the news echoes the language of the state. And you wouldn't know it if you went to school because schools are run by the state. Do you still believe everything you learned in school? Or anything? They didn't just mislead you. They taught you what to think. What we learned was to talk like the ruling class, making all the same assumptions they want us to. Now I look for people who tell it like it is, because they challenge those assumptions. Of course, nowadays many people say they only care about the truth and facts and logic and the rest of it, but they use their soapbox to spread bigotry against black people or trans people or immigrants or more likely all of the above. Those people aren't interested in honesty or frank discussions. It seems one of the key skills anyone can learn nowadays is to evaluate people's arguments critically. You won't learn it in school. When people are long on rhetoric and short on facts, I get suspicious. When they lie or exaggerate wildly, I have no more interest in listening to them. For example, you and I can be united in our distaste for a politician, but when you start saying the guy's Hitler, I lose interest. Whoever you're talking about, no, he isn't. We're used to speaking metaphorically and figuratively and exaggerating, or speaking in euphemisms, some of which is the result of a desire to avoid making direct reference to taboos. People who don't want to refer to excretion, and I promise I won't do it again, say they're going to powder their noses. When they want you to come over and have sex, they might say, Netflix and chill? So euphemisms are quite normal, but when you start learning how states and corporations and propaganda work, you might notice all the words describing the most important things are euphemisms. And those euphemisms are by design. They're a deliberate evasion of the truth. Here's one you might know. What's the term that the US military uses when it kills civilians? collateral damage. They didn't kill those people. There was some collateral damage. Whoops! <laughs> Sorry. It's quite simple why they would need to dress up language so much. What they do conflicts with what they say they do. And what they do is so objectionable, if they didn't use euphemisms, we would realize what these systems really do, and whom they really work for. So accurate language matters. It's how we learn from each other. So why do we still call it the justice system, when it's clearly a system of punishment? Is it so that we'll unconsciously connect justice with punishment? Is punishment the same as justice? Who taught you to think like that? Bell Hooks, the author and feminist writer and activist, lots of things, would always refer to the system of the U.S. as the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. She said people would laugh at her for calling it that. That's because no one is used to telling it like it is. 
Bell Hooks was breaking a taboo, referring to oppressive systems as oppressive systems, instead of maintaining the charade of democracy and human rights. In some parts of the world, they put you in prison for doing that. Elsewhere, they just don't take you seriously. <laughs> How could the U.S. be imperialist with only, like, a thousand military bases all over the world and finding a new place to bomb every couple of years? <laughs> Silly, right? How could it be white supremacist except that it's always been based on a racial caste system and slavery as results of colonialism? which have shaped just about everything the government has ever done. I think people who would deny the U.S. is an imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, and other things you might not like to hear, probably don't know as much about the country and its history as they think. And they're committed to patriotic myths. People like Bell Hooks, who tell it like it is, do so because they can see a little clearer. And they're not afraid of breaking taboos, however many death threats they receive. Likewise, until recently, the word genocide was avoided in discussion of Native peoples and their history. Toning down the language can make the listener feel no real injustice has been done, even if half the people have been wiped out. And a lot of people still aren't using the word genocide right, as they use it to refer to things that aren't genocide by any definition, like immigration or giving out free COVID vaccines. But suddenly become skeptics and historians when the word is used to describe the genocides that scorch the land they live on. That's their way of saying, it's only a problem when it happens to me. Telling it like it is means questioning the language used to express everyday phenomena. What do you see here? Some see representative democracy. I see spokespeople for the ruling class. Every day I hear them say they're working for you while receiving their orders from rich people. And it doesn't matter how much you shuffle around the same people in the same big room, the institution itself works for the rich. It always has. Every day since its inception, it cannot be made to work for the rest of us. There is no democracy. The word democracy, as anyone who's taken a civics class knows, refers to government by the people, or for the people, or of the people, whatever. And no such thing has ever been achieved. When did you get to decide on policy? When were you even consulted? <laughs> Never. But aren't you the people? Aren't people living in the streets, regularly harassed and beaten by police, the people? If this is a democracy, then democracy must mean rule by some people. Because those folks didn't beat themselves up. The, this version of democracy means hierarchy, and poverty, and war, and police to keep it all in place. Doesn't sound like the people are in charge. Sounds like we live in a class society under the rule of an oligarchy. But when have you ever heard it expressed that way in the news? It's not telling it like it is to repeat the lines you've been told to say, like calling politicians or government your representatives, or saying their job is to run the country. It's not telling it like it is to assume their job is to work for us, and if they don't, the system must have failed or broken down. If a politician promises to lower taxes, don't say he's going to lower taxes, say he has promised to lower taxes. When people realize the emptiness of a political promise, or how dog whistles work, they can figure out what was really meant. Maybe nothing. Maybe cuts to public services. Don't say you're voting for certain policies. You don't get to vote for policies. You can only vote for people who may or may not implement those policies. Do the media provide any perspective on the issues? 
Do they give any history of political promises and how often they get implemented? Or do they just report what officials say? In government, and therefore media too, it's common to reverse the meanings of the words state and nation. For example, they'll say, Ten nations in the UN Security Council voted in favor. No, ten states did. The nation is people, the imagined community created by the state. A more precise word for country is the nation-state, because the state creates and rules the nation. What does it mean to rule? Well, I answer that question in this video that you can watch. Uh, but confusing nation and state seems like a minor mistake, or, or maybe mild rhetoric. But it's much more than that. Propaganda all over the world deliberately conflates the people with the state, because they want you to think they're the same. If the state can be said to represent the people, then it must be legitimate. Journalists don't have the freedom to tell it like it is because of pressure from editors, who are under pressure from owners. So I wonder who it is that forces journalists to write such convoluted headlines just to say the police killed someone. Like this one, stray bullet kills girl as officers fire at suspect. We're firing at a suspect, it was just a stray bullet. Same with this one on the same incident. Teenager fatally shot, so killed, by suspected police bullet. We, we suspect it was a police bullet that somehow found its way into her chest. I, I don't know, you know, how that could possibly have happened, you know. Now they often refer to an officer-involved shooting. As if to say the cop, you know, was there. <laughs> but let's not blame anyone. Sure, one's dead following a shooting that was somehow, you know, an officer may have been involved in peripherally. It's like they wanted to remove all agency from police killings, as if some incomprehensible force propelled the bullets into their victims rather than some trigger-happy cops. Journalists who want to be journalists should just stop taking police at their word. But that might require more work, and then they might not meet their deadlines. But why even ask the police? Why not ask people who don't have their own PR departments? Police can't use honest language, or they would reveal their purpose. They can't say they kidnap people, so they have to call it arrest. They can't say they're feeding the highly profitable prison slave labor market. They have to say they're keeping the streets clean and free of dangerous substances and people. They can't say they gunned someone down for being black, so they have to say they feared for their lives, thought he had a gun, just upholding the law, etc., etc., so their supporters can go back to sleep. If there's a crowd, police always say the same thing. People have the right to assemble peacefully, but we won't tolerate any unlawful behavior. And journalists don't question it, even though we know from countless videos, police regularly attack nonviolent protests, especially when they're led by black or indigenous people. Meanwhile, recently the world saw a full-scale occupation of the capital city of Canada, with locals being harassed and terrorized because some people don't like to wear masks. And the police supported them, until the government invoked emergency powers. They needed emergency powers to get the police to enforce the law. If you say the police always enforce the law, or they enforce it evenly and fairly and equally, you are wrong and we have proof. In business, practically nothing is said frankly. 
Tricking people into buying stuff they don't need is called sales. Inventing feelings for you to associate with institutions that exist to make a profit is called branding. And submitting to another person's will for most of the time you're awake is called a job. At work, you need to toe the line. In the interview, they ask you why you want the job, and what do you say? You talk about how great the company is, how interesting the field is, how much you're hoping to learn from it. But what's the real answer? Because it pays! Because we live in a world that demands you use money for everything. Because I don't want to live in the street. And you can't say that even after you get the job, because you're still supposed to put on a happy face and pretend to be motivated by something other than the threat of homelessness. If you want to talk about freedom of speech, well, <laughs> it's not available in the workplace. Language around the accumulation of wealth is full of euphemisms, and I avoid using them. I don't talk about job creators. I call them the people with all the money. I don't call it passive income. I call it getting other people to do the work. Although the word landlord being feudal in origin seems to be accurate to this day. Someone owns the land, just owns it or the property and extracts rent from the people who live on it or in it. A friend of mine started renting out her house and told me, now my house is working for me. I said, no, your tenants are working for you. They work to give you rent to continue to have a home. I'm a lot of fun at parties. In politics, you have the same problem as business. You use the vocabulary you're supposed to use. So you can't be frank. You can't say you're doing it for money, power, influence, prestige, and so on, even behind closed doors. You have to keep up the charade. Otherwise, you could get demoted or squeezed out and lose all the support and influence you need to get things done. You have to say you're doing it for this nation, this wonderful country of ours that I just love so much. <laughs> These beautiful people in our glorious culture dating back 200 million years. Fortunately for politicians, bureaucrats, generals, whoever else is at the top, there is no transparency in government, and no one in the media asks them important questions. They ask for assurances, which are easy to give. I promise I will do all the things you want me to do. Security. Families, health care, education, jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, vote for me. Yes. That's not what I want from journalists. I want to know everyone the people at the top have done deals with and what was arranged. Then we'll get a better idea of how power works. But we never hear about that. We're not allowed to know. So we don't know what goes on in government. We just hear a version of it afterwards. Political language is full of contradictions. We talk about the corruption of a broken system when the system's working, performing exactly as intended. We say we value freedom, but can find a million excuses for the existence of prisons, borders, poverty, and other things guaranteed to destroy freedom. We talk about drugs as if they were all bad and their use needs to be punished, except we sell alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine in every store. And Americans have the nerve to call other places dictatorships with no freedom. When this kind of thing happens every day. I never use the word extremism since I think it's misleading. We live in extreme times. Wouldn't you call flying planes around the world to drop bombs on people extreme? No, because the word is only ever used to discredit angry people, to call them brainwashed, and throw them in prison. I don't talk about terrorism, because it's the kind of word 
that now is used to mean so many different things, it lo no longer seems to mean anything. People use the word terrorism to describe pretty much anything they strongly disapprove of. I might say some people are terrorizing others, because that happens, or that they've killed people, or whatever it is, but terrorism is just too vague. It's just rhetoric. As I pointed several times before out uh, here, I don't have a problem with crime, per se, because crime just means illegal stuff. If the focus is on crime, we're expected to assume the law and law enforcement are legitimate. The focus should be on them. I don't want the police to be tough on crime. I want the police to be tough on each other's legal and ethical violations. But that never happens. We talk about fighting crime, but not of doing something about state violence. We talk about mass incarceration, but maybe we should talk about mass criminalization, because the latter is the cause of the former. We get furious hearing about petty theft, like shoplifting. But how many times has the news talked about the much bigger phenomenon of wage theft? There's a link in the description to uh, explain this if, if you don't quite get it. All I know is I've never heard anything about wage theft on the news, or in poli-sci class, or in economics class. Politics also introduces a certain sensitivity on the part of people who don't like to call a spade a spade. They get offended by the truth, reacting with anger or mocking dismissal. Beliefs are part of our identity, and the truth challenges all the most strongly held beliefs. You may have noticed how sensitive some white people are when you bring up racism, especially when you call it white supremacy. But that sensitivity shields them from the truth. Their objections are an attempt to shut down the conversation on race that badly needs to be had. And, and those objections betray their feelings. They get angrier at someone bringing up the topic of racism than they do at the racism. Okay, let's, let's talk about supposed to. Most people don't know how to recognize propaganda, um, so they don't notice the flaws in their thinking about how the system works. And every day, I hear someone refer to agents of the state and say they're supposed to work for us. Every time politicians do what no one wants them to, except their biggest campaign donators, donors, someone says, but politicians are supposed to work for us. Every time the courts sentence an innocent or harmless person to prison, we say, but the courts are supposed to provide justice. Every time the police get caught killing someone on camera, someone goes, but they're supposed to protect us, not kill us. Please stop saying these words. They are phrases we've picked up from the propaganda and we repeat them as if they were our own thoughts or, or facts. We've seen countless examples in our lifetime that would disprove these beliefs. But the thing about belief is it often overrides even the most con incontrovertible evidence. The thing is, if by supposed to, you mean intended to, or designed to, or directed to, then you're wrong. They aren't. State institutions have never been intended to protect and serve us. Those are its slogans. Then there's nationalism. Nationalism introduces all kinds of new linguistic twists and turns. For instance, Russia invaded Ukraine. Hmm. This is a concise but pretty simplistic way of looking at things that leads to all kinds of misunderstandings. For one thing, countries are very abstract entities. When you talk about a country, what do you mean? You know, when you say Russia invaded Ukraine, who are you talking about? All of Russia? Clearly not. How much of it? Well, the Kremlin and the military, anyway. 
How much of what we call Russia do they comprise? Do they include all the civilians who've been attacked around the world just because they are Russian? Did they join the war on Ukraine? For all we know, they oppose it. Plenty of Russians have been protesting the war, after all. But because some people can't see past the names of countries, they're okay with punishing everyone apparently associated with that country for the actions of their rulers. I'm expecting Russian salad dressing to be pulled off the shelves any day now. People use the word country to mean anything. And they'll say we to mean the country, even if it doesn't include them. Like a working class person saying we're a rich country. What does it mean? What does it mean if, if you, you think you're a rich country when you're poor? Do you just not count as part of the country? We're not a racist country, they might say. Then why are there so many racists? Are they not part of the country? Some people use country and government interchangeably, and I kind of disagree, but at least it's much more correct than saying, I love my country, but not my government as there would be no country without the government. But then they use the word we when they mean the government. Like, we liberated Europe from the Nazis. Huh. You seem a little young. Hmm. It's weird to me to use we when it doesn't include yourself, you know? Some people certainly ended Nazi rule. But I've noticed the people who take credit for it don't also brag about killing a million civilians in Iraq. Hmm. The problem here is these words attempt to capture very abstract entities and create false associations. If you talk about a country, you are necessarily talking about a set of institutions, because the country would not exist without them. Are you also talking about the people? Because if so, saying we are a something country doesn't make sense, because it includes people who are not like that. But we can associate the stigma of racism with an entire country and write the whole place off as racist. It's obvious in the case of uh, Russian propaganda in its invasion of Ukraine, where Putin and thousands of his supporters online keep repeating the line about Ukraine being full of Nazis. All anyone seems to know about is the infamous Azov Battalion. They don't question the stated aim of the war. They don't acknowledge all the Nazis in Russia or the puppet states it's slicing out of Ukraine that would presumably be pre pretty easy to catch if Putin really wanted to. If you say you support the people of Ukraine, they say, oh, so you support the Azov Battalion too, probably. I guess if you're used to people to, to so many people who are unwilling and unable to tell it like it is, you'll always try to look for hidden meanings. So they keep repeating as of, as of, as of, to make you associate 40 million people with Nazis, so you lose sympathy for them. Another video I'm planning to make is to ask people to stop conflating hate with bigotry. They're two different things. Not all hatred is prejudice, and more importantly, not all prejudice is hate. Hatred is a feeling. Bigotry is ideology. Bigotry is much more about, it's, it's at least as much about contempt as it is for hate. And at its root, it's about power. Hating puts you on the person's level. Hate you can change. If you hate me, maybe you just don't know me. So maybe I might be able to be nice to you, show you I'm not so bad, win your respect. Or maybe it's my fault you hate me. So maybe I could just change. Maybe I should. But bigots don't even give you a chance. They just think that just by belonging to a group, they, they made up. You have inherent qualities that, that put you beneath them which entitles them to use violence on you. It's not the same as intolerance, either. First of all, to tolerate means to put up with. 
bigots might well tolerate members of the groups they hate, but they might just be biding their time. But more importantly, toleration is not inherently good. I mean, if some people would harass, attack, and, well, do worse stuff to anyone they choose, or just spread their lies to others, I don't tolerate them. I undermine them. I prevent them. They don't deserve a place at the table of the cafeteria of ideas or whatever metaphors people use to justify tolerating bigotry. Bigots will almost never admit publicly what they are. They don't say things like, we need to kill all those people. They say, we need to defend our country and our civilization. Against whom? Well, all those evil brown people, of course. But they don't need to say the subtext to enact border controls, surveillance, and segregation. You might have noticed a lot of unconscious racism in the reports coming out of Ukraine. The channel No Justice did a great video on this, which I link to in the description, so we don't need to see it here. Reporters talk about being saddened because the victims had blonde hair and blue eyes. Because they care way less when victims of war are brown, clearly. They use the word civilized. Again, probably without realizing how racist they're being. Civilized means white. We're supposed to think of the civilized as all that's good in the world, when historically it's usually meant a part of the world that makes war on another part of the world. I've made a whole series on it you can find in the description too, if you want to learn. All right, let's wrap this up, shall we? You may have noticed a certain backlash against telling it like it is, especially recently. You might have heard people shout about cancel culture when someone's trying to hold them accountable for their words. Instead of talking about what the person said and what's wrong with it, suddenly we're talking about something else. Cancel culture and wokeness and the left is out of control because people get called out for their bigotry. Joe Rogan has repeatedly used racial slurs, platformed a whole bunch of bigots, shit all over trans people, and spread lies about vaccines. But when people start talking about consequences for his words... It will eventually get to straight white men are not allowed to talk. Joe, thanks for thinking of me. I appreciate it. But if you're that concerned... You could always give me some of that hundred mil you got from Spotify. I'm sure I could buy a platform with it. The fact is, many people are threatened by the truth because it would undermine their power, their wealth, or their goals. Telling the truth about racism is bad for racists. Telling the truth about tyranny is bad for tyrants. So let's keep it up. Thanks for being here. Before I go, here are a few of the topics I just didn't have the time to make videos for this week.